Yeah. Good morning, good morning, St. Pete. How y'all doing out there, man? This is your main man, Matt B, man. Y'all know it. Coming to you live every Thursday morning right here on 99 Jams, the Berg Radio, man, with We The People, man. Listen, folks, we're going to make history in the building today, man. We're literally making history, man. We have we have someone right here on the phone, on the, on the Zoom with us today, folks, that... Uh, has made history, folks. If you want to be part of this conversation, man, that's 727-637-2416, man. Call us and be part of this amazing uh, uh, moment, man. We are ex we are exclusive for y'all, man. Let me get back on track, man. Facebook, Facebook, if you're out there watching us this morning, man, as always, man, y'all know I appreciate y'all, man. All right. Got a piece of history with us today, man. His name will be forever referenced in the highest court of the land. This brother represented himself all the way to the Supreme Court and received a favorable decision, folks. I'm talking about the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm talking about Clarence Thomas, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm talking about Brent Kavanaugh and them, the Supreme Court. His case was accepted by the Supreme Court on his first attempt. That has only happened four times in the history. That has only happened four times in the history of the Supreme Court. Let me say that again. This, what this brother accomplished has only happened four times in the history of the Supreme Court. This brother is the only person in the history to do this without an attorney. So he is one of one, folks. We got one of one on Matt B. Live this morning in 99 Jams, all right? This is uh, one in 2016, the moment the Supreme Court ruled in this brother's favor, over 1,300 federal inmates were freed instantly. This, that's equivalent to shutting down a whole correctional facility, folks. So not only that, but uh, he didn't do it. He, did, he worked without any help from an attorney until the, la the latter part. Again, he made history with the Supreme Court. He helped free over a thousand people. They gained their freedom. Everybody went home except for him. So even though what he found in the what he found was to be unconstitutional, his case did not fit within the guidelines, and he did not go home. So after a huge victory in the Supreme Court and watching over 1,300 of his peers gain their freedom because of his sacrifice, he had to go back to the drawing board because, hey, it's okay to make history, but when you're trying to get freedom, nothing compares to that. So this brother did, you know, indeed go back to the drawing board. And what this brother said to me, man, it touched me, man. What the brother told me, you know, just in a regular conversation, man, he said, what they didn't know about me, man, is I was a single father before I went in, and I was just trying to get back home to my children. So this brother did indeed go back to the drawing board. He petitioned the court and was released in May of 2020, folks. And this is his first public appearance since he made history right here with us on the Matt B Live and 99 Jams. Man, y'all ought to be thankful this morning, man. We have, we have, we're bringing, we're bringing some of the brightest minds in the country to you right here this morning, man. So I'm, I'm so excited, man. I'm already off track because I'm so excited. Let me reel myself in. All right, all right. again, uh, this is a monumental story. This is something that has never done, been done before. Let me give his brother his props. From the landmark Supreme Court case, Welch versus the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Gregory Welch to the show. Welcome to the show, my brother. Thank you. Good morning. How are you doing today? Awesome, man. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I know that. And, um, yes. I'm, gonna, I'm ready. Excuse me? Yeah. Let me, let me, let me go with protocol, Mr. Wells. Let me go with protocol and, and introduce the rest of my guests. Now, 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 before we get into it, right, Gregory Wells is here this morning with us because of my next guest. Ladies and gentlemen, when you struggle with somebody in the trenches and you get to know somebody, that's a bond that you can't really build. <laughs> outside the trenches. So this next guest, man, it is with great pleasure, love, and respect that I introduced this brother, man. He was instrumental in the start of the Gregory Wells story. His, in his own words, he is one of Child Park's finest. He is a survivor, and he is one of the most intelligent brothers I know, man. He is currently working side by side with Mr. Welch as his manager. And again, man, this is my brother from another mother. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bilal Francis. Yes, um, good morning, man. Word on. I just like to say um, it's a pleasure to be here. And you know, like we've been through the trenches together. Yes. And I just like to say to everybody out there, this is a significant story. 
And Mr. Welch is man, a man amongst men. With yes. that, I'm out. There you go. And also, you see Mr. Travis in the building this morning. Mr. Travis is Bilal Francis' son, and he is intricately involved. We all got, um, everybody on this got their own brains and their own skill set. He is the brain of the operation when it comes to the business side. He's a young CPA. And let me just give you all a real fun fact about this young brother. This young brother walked away from a law degree at Columbia University to be a father for his children. So folks, we got some really gifted folks. We got some really, uh, really special. So I'm gonna jump right in it. Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch, you were sentenced to a 15 year minimum sentence in the federal system. 15 and life. You, huh? it's 15 to life. 15 to life, which is big. Yeah. That's a big deal. Man, minimum 15 to life. Right. Wow. And, and you decided not to accept that fate and fight back, man. Talk to yeah. me about how, what was your mindset going in? Uh, my mindset going in is what really propelled me to, to actually become begin begin the fight, mm -hmm. because um, once I was sentenced, I realized that it was unconstitutional, and that it could not stand. Meaning that I didn't understand the federal laws, and by me not understanding the federal laws, what happened was I was searching for an answer to why I got 15 years. Mm -hmm. I was uh, black boxed and sent to a penitentiary. What a black box is, is when they put a black box around your hand for any kind of transport like you're dangerous. Wow. Because me and the judge had some choice words when I got sentenced. Mm -hmm. And when I was sent to the penitentiary, I realized that I've actually seen no hope. I've seen it. I've seen guys give up. I've seen guys try to kill themselves. I've, I've seen guys become homosexuals. I've seen every negative connotation that could be thought of in a prison environment. And in federal prison, it's a lot different than state prison because you're locked up with basically the worst of the worst in the world. Like if you hear of a terrorist getting kicked, getting arrested and brought to justice in America, he's in a federal penitentiary. If you hear of a narco terrorist or a drug lord being arrested, they're sent to a federal penitentiary. If you hear a hedge fund manager getting arrested and he's got a hundred years, he's going to a penitentiary. These are the people that I, I was locked up with. And I knew that I had to find a way out because I was not gonna cooperate with the government. Um, when I came in, one of the blessings that I did have was that a lot of older inmates that was on some positive stuff, seeing that I was always trying to do something positive, meaning that I went straight to the law library and I didn't know how to use the computers or use the books. I'll say, hey, how do you use this? And sometimes I would get frustrated. And um, that's how I met Mr. Francis, because he would always say to me, like, man, you're like a fish out of water. It's like, you don't belong here. And he said, man, you can always do something better. And I had another brother that was with me named uh, Unique. He also helped me also. They was like partners. And they would always say, man, it's something about you that you don't belong here. I said, I know this. I said, what they gave me was a really messed up sentence. And then they, we started talking. And then once they found out the time I got there, everybody shook their head like, wow. And I said, he said, um, they probably gave you that time because you didn't want to cooperate. I said, I know that. And I said, that's not right. And they said, all right. They said, all right, just, just do what you're doing. So I said, okay. And to make a bad situation worse, I didn't understand federal laws. I didn't know how to write a motion. I didn't know how to basically apply myself in the way that was needed, but I knew that I wanted to learn it. Right. And once I started applying myself, I started seeing the significance of the law, meaning that even though me and the judge got into it, I realized he had a job to do. You know what I mean? Even though that I was incarcerated, I've done something to be, to be incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So when I started looking at the factors of what actually the position that I was in, I said, okay, how can I fight this? And then I realized in the federal system, it's based on the constitution. As much as you would think that it's not, it's really based on the constitution. So I started studying that. And I started studying case laws that were supported by the constitution. And that's how I, I started to understand what was going on in my life. Meaning that I was not only normalizing the wrong things and thinking that they was okay. I was living off of no rules that was legitimate. And by not doing living off of legitimate rules, I put myself in a situation to be crossed up like that. Mm -hmm. And then I, 
I said to myself, how can I get out of this? And I just started studying law and I basically fell in love with it. Not fall in love with it to the sense that I would, I would give up everything. I fell in love with it because most guys in prison would read novels. I would read cases, like entire cases from the person got locked up all the way to their last litigation. And I would memorize it to where we would have a conversation like it was my case. And they would say, how do you know that? I said, because I read it and I, and I accepted it as mine. So I'm going to fight it as it's mine. And then as I started seeing that, I've always kept an open line of communication with the public defenders, meaning that I was asked, I would call them a million times and say, hey, I need help with this question. Can you answer this question for me? And they'll say, all right. But I've, re I've maintained that relationship because I said, I looked at what they were going through, as in the caseload they had, the, the average person was probably did not want to talk to him because they got convicted and they right. didn't want to, they just didn't know, one, know it's not a happy place to talk to an attorney mm -hmm. unless it's the U.S. attorney you're trying to get out. And right. that's what most guys do. Not everybody, but most mm -hmm. guys do that. Mm -hmm. So I said that that wasn't going to be my option. When I specifically started talking to the public defender's office, they started telling me that, you know what I mean? If you don't understand something, write it down. Then they started telling me about different jurisdictions then they started telling me about the different levels of law and the, how to apply the, the right procedure with the law. And they always told me to keep an open mind as to what I'm reading. Don't think about it with emotion. Think about it with legal facts. Mm -hmm. So I just basically would say, hey, so I got to basically keep it real on the paper. It's like, yeah, just simple as that. Mm -hmm. It's when you write, don't write, don't write complaining. Right. Let me ask you this. Is that normal for the uh, line of communication to be at or did they notice your... Um your intelligent level and your uh, desire for, for the law. Did they notice that? And is that what, you know? Yeah, they did. They did because what happened was um, uh, my defender, when he, when I was saying this, he was crying mm -hmm. and I was upset. That's what made me and the judge get into it. And my mom was crying mm -hmm. and I became upset. So I was like, you know what? I said, I, I, I can't, I can't look. Y'all, y'all, y'all work with us. Y'all work with us. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. I said I wasn't going to lay down. Right. And when I said I wasn't going to lay down, I thought about them. Mm -hmm. I thought about my children. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to prison, I actually seen that there was people that didn't have the intelligence or the intellect to continue to fight. It was very, it was a very small number of individuals that are like that. Mm -hmm. And then you had individuals in there that would take advantage of people like that. And then you would meet, um, the reason why I became who I became is because I'm very aggressive when it comes to achieving anything. I don't believe in stopping. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in giving up and I don't believe in playing the victim card. And what the victim card is, is when you say, man, these people done gave me all this time. And you just best, you just basically sulk in that anger and say, that's, it's justifiable. Right. I don't accept that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't accept anger, bitterness, and, and defeat. That's just not something I'm not, every defeat is a lesson to move forward to me. Wow. And once, I'm, I'm, I apologize, excuse me. You know what I think is so important because what people don't understand is, so you evolved from just saying, I'm not going to lay down to first helping other people with their cases, right? Right. I want to, I want to bring in uh, Mr. Bilal. When, how did, when did you first, uh, when did Mr. Gregory first get on your radar, Mr. Francis? And, uh, and when did you, uh, you know, when did you notice that he had something and how did that kind of evolve? Well, first of all, being being in prison or just like being in the streets, man, you could tell when somebody's like out of their element. Mm -hmm. And I seen Mr. Welch moving around and um, uh, you know, being Jamaican heritage, I know, I know, uh, um, I'm familiar with his family. And I told him, man, I was like, man, you're a fish out of your water, man. You out of your element, man. Don't don't let your surroundings get to you, man. A lot of these people, a lot of these guys are the way they are because 
of their upbringing or whatever the circumstance may be. But you're you're different, man. But don't feed into the madness, man. Don't let it get to you, man. But what are you gonna do about it? Mm-hmm. I see something in you. You know what I'm saying? And um, he was sitting on the bench one day, and I walked up on him. <laughs> I was, he got his head now. I walked yeah. up on him. I said, "Hey, man, you gonna let it get to you like that?" First day, he looked up to me and said, "Oh, are you with them? Are you one of them?" <laughs> I said, "We on we we in the penitentiary. We on the rec yard, man." Well, um, lines are, lines aren't crossed and things are divided. So I'm mm. like, no, nah, man, I keep telling you, man, this ain't it, man. You got something in you, man. Just keep fighting, man. You understand what I'm saying? The world owes us nothing. We owe ourselves everything, man. Mm. And like I say, you know, Greg Welch is, um, you see it in people, man. You, you might see the talent, you know what I mean? And it's just, right. I just told him, man, don't give up. And he was mm. smart enough. He was moving in and don't get caught up in the madness, man. Right. A lot of time, man, young brothers and sisters get time, man, and they get in an environment, and you become a product of your environment. And right. I and I told him not to do that, and he and he did what he did, man. And I'm proud of him. I'm proud of you also, Matt Bird. You yeah, understand what I'm saying? Because you did you did what you did. You know what I'm yeah. saying? A lot of people don't know your story, but I'm definitely and most of all, man, proud to be on the first radio show with my son, man. Wow. That's that that that's that that means everything to me, man. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But if you have family members out there in the system or you see a brother or sister going through something, man, just remember with every face, there's a story. Yeah. With every face, there's a story, man. Mm-hmm. And with that, um, it's all about Welch and Mr. Baton, man. All right, man. I'm done, man. All right. Well, Mr. Welch, like, I think it's very important to point out that um, you, fought, you fought your case, right? You fought your case and Let's, let's, let's go ahead and let's just get into your, your case. Let's talk about when you really started seeing that, like that, that, that you had an um, a opportunity to win. Let's talk about that, you know, and then I also want to really stress the magnitude of the fact that when you won, you still wasn't free. So, you know, go ahead and take us to, to when you really started seeing the, the light in your case. Okay, by reading my case, I already knew the definition of what's called the residual clause in the Armed Career Act. The Armed Career Act, Career Act was drafted in 1984, and it was basically passed when it was called the, the lame duck session. And what they did was they enhanced the drug laws and they enhanced the violent felony for the, the, excuse me, the sentencing for violent felonies. And they was basically said that a felon that's held in possession of a firearm is subject to 15 years to life, 924E2B2. When they did that, I fell under the category of defendants that was qualified for the 15 years to life. So they had cases like I read now, like that, that if you subscribe to certain um, like news channels in prison, they'll send you different updates on different <clears throat> cases that are being litigated. I was con- constantly reading those things, but I also knew my issue. So by knowing my issue, I said, okay, hey, I went to a couple of jailhouse lawyers in there and you know what I'm saying? Me and them had some choice words because everyone thought I was crazy when I said, hey, I think I can win in the Supreme Court. And they was like, nah, you never win in the Supreme Court. They're not gonna let no black man get in there like that. And they're not gonna let no inmate get in there like that. The only inmate that did that, you know, you, you know who that was. But at the same time, they came back and said, nah, it's not gonna happen. So I said, no, it is gonna happen. And they said, no, it's not. I said, okay. In my my gut instincts told me that it was a possibility it could happen. Just like every other thing that I've fought and I've won, my instincts told me it was going to happen. So therefore, I knew I had something because I said, this is unconstitutional. They can't keep me in prison for something that's not right if the law had been changed. So I was reading the other case, which was coincides with mine. It's called Johnson. And uh, in, the, in the Supreme Court, every year they have a case called a follow-up case. But in legal terms, it's called a progeny. What a progeny is, it's the offspring of a main of another issue. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. A progeny is something that derives from another issue. And my case was in line to be the progeny. So when I was denied in the Court of Appeals, which was two weeks before Johnson was decided, I tried to file what's called a motion for reconsideration. At the time, one of the guys that I was looking, looking, looking up to in the legal terms as a mentor, me and him had gotten into it. 
because he said I was too determined, I was too adamant about getting things on in a particular way, and I was too stubborn. And then he basically pulled me to the side and said, bro, you're too smart. I, I can't teach you. And I said, nah, you can't do that. I said, you're older than me. You got to teach me. He's like, nah. He said, nah, this is one of the things I got to tell you no on. And me and him, we basically separated for like a couple of years because he said we couldn't hold a conversation anymore. Because he would ask a question and I'll go deeper with the question. And then one thing about me, I'm very analytical. Meaning that if you're going to tell me that someone got beaten up, I want to know why they got beaten up. Who was the officer that did it? Why the officer did it? Where did he live at? What policy he followed? What did the mayor, the city commissioner, the, the county manager, I want to know all of that. I want to get into detail. And did this person have a mental disability that got into it? I want to know everything. Because I'm looking at it from a full circle angle. I'm not looking at bipartisan. No, I'm not doing that. So that's how I approach the law. So. When they denied me in the Court of Appeals, it's the same thing. I said, you know what I'm saying? Oh, man, how can they deny me when I have the issue for relief? Let me ask you something real quick. Um, how much time had you already had in? Because you said that you didn't talk to the brother for two years. So how many years did you work on this case to get to this, to this, just to this point where we are right now? Um, altogether, my case? Yes. My case, I did 10 years fighting my case, literally. Not including other cases that I fought with other people. Mm. I just recently won against the DOJ in Washington, D.C. Mm. And I'm still litigating that through, through an attorney now, but he basically lets me do paralegal work on it and file it. So but basically you do all the paperwork. They, and, and basically you do you do the legwork and they got the name behind it and the credentials behind it pretty much. Yeah, but... It's, but in the legal field, it's always been like that. Mm -hmm. Understood. So there's always someone that does that. But like I said, um, I approach things with empathy. Mm -hmm. And I look at the issue as if, as if I was in that position, mm -hmm. what I would do. Mm -hmm. So with that approach, I'm going to continue to try to keep fighting it to win because I'm going to look at the angles that could possibly work. Mm -hmm. Not... Y'all work with us out there, man. We having a little bit, you know, we on technology and it don't always cooperate, man. We are talking to Gregory Welsh, man, the only black federal inmate to argue a case all the way to the Supreme Court and receive a favorable condition, man. I mean, uh, uh, well, what is it? A, a favorable decision, man. In other words, he won only one of one, the only black inmate to do this. So you back on with us? Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay, here. I apologize. Yeah. All right, so, man. So you um, spent ten years until until your um that the Johnson case was decided. No, it was, I did. Two thousand sixteen, two thousand fifteen was five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've altogether done five years when Johnson came out. Understood. Got gotcha. you. And I filed my petition in. Well, I'm gonna tell you how the petition was filed. Mm -hmm. I asked a jailhouse attorney to help me because I didn't know how to fill out the, the certiorari form. It's a long form, about 16 pages. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand the proceedings on how to fill it out. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, me, I'm the type of person that if I don't understand something, I'm not going to, how the young guys say, I'm not going to cap and make it seem like right. I know it. I don't, I'm not like that. So I went to a person and said, how do you do this? Mm -hmm. And he again looked at me like, something was wrong and said nah he said nah so i said all right just do it and i'll be all right he said so i so he did it mm -hmm. and then i said nah hell no nah. i read it i said no nah and he came and i went back to him and he said that's why i told you to do your own thing he said you you stop believing in yourself mm -hmm. he said do you Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I did that. I, I minimized it to five, six pages. Yes. Six pages. And in the six pages, what I did was I broke down the unconstitutionality of what's going on between the circuits because the, the Supreme Court does not accept cases unless, unless you can prove there's what's called a circuit split. 
Mm -hmm. And once you can prove a circuit split, what happens is it's got to be a circuit split, but it's got to be an issue of national importance. And when you can solidify that there's a national importance of the issue, then they'll come in and divide it or either clarify it so all the circuits are in line with that particular issue. And that case becomes precedent. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done. I've mm -hmm. took a 30 page motion that this person did, threw it away. And I've downsized it to six pages mm -hmm. with five case sites and the Supreme Court accepted it. Is that where they talk about Wells petition was the only straight petition that could resolve this important issue through the court's regular uh, process? Yeah, that, mm -hmm. it was straight to the point. Okay, yeah. I didn't, I I didn't try to sound like I, I, I've been studying the law for 100 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't try to make it seem like I was too intelligent. I just got straight to the point. Right. I said, the 11th Circuit said they can't do this. The 11th Circuit said they could do this. I'm in the 11th Circuit. They're still using my case in the 11th Circuit. Please stop letting them do that to the nation. You're dividing us. Wow. And they came back and said, you know what, you're right. And the government agreed with me at first. Mm. The government agreed. They said that he is right. So they had to appoint someone what's called an amicus. Amicus curate to come in and say, well, based on the fact that the government agrees with Mr. Welch, someone has to be the deciding factor for the government. And the government started agreeing with me at the argument. They said, Mr. Welch is right. It is retroactive. Mm -hmm. Mr. Welch has a clear cut issue and we litigate against that. We, we humbly side with him. So not only did I win, I also got the government to side with me and say that I should win. And what I did was I filed the petition with the anticipation of them waiving their right to argue that issue again. And they did that. And that's what made the case so significant because you rarely get the government to side with you before an argument. Yeah, it says it says here I'm reading out of the Bloomberg law that Gregory Welsh bought both of these trends when the high court agreed to take up his case. <laughs> so, you know, it is. It also, um, it also talks about the other attorneys that eventually joined forces with you. Um, it also said that Ali and Harrison filed two petitions with the Supreme Court on this issue, but it was denied and dismissed. But they also came across Welch's petition. Welch had represented himself uh, in the Circuit Court, even asking the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eleventh Circuit Court to hold the case while the Johnson case was still being argued. And then it goes on to say that they did, uh, you guys did join forces, but what they did mention in this article is that they continued to consult Welch. And they said, uh, they said also, um, they talked about your intelligent level as a client, you know? So talk to me a little bit about your relationship with people in, in the actual legal field. What kind of respect do you have amongst the, the people that actually do this? They'll say something like, is that is that Gregory Welch on the phone? Wow. <laughs> <Gregory Welch? laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I talked to him. <laughs> yeah. Are you um do you see like like your case? Will this be taught in law schools? Will this be talked about in law schools and things of that nature? Yeah, I've written I've written a book about the experience um helping attorneys bridge the gap with their clients and okay. helping them understand the significance of clear communication with their clients and yeah. so that moving forward that the in order to win like Sonia Sotomayor said when she was talking about retroactivity mm. she said uh, attorneys have to understand that their cases are really living people mm. and once you know that they're living people then you act actually understand their issues mm -hmm. all of my attorneys understood my, my my passion they understood what I was talking about because right. I researched and I said okay I'm not going to dump my, my case on you. I'm not going to dump my problems on you. I want you to understand that when this phone hangs up, I go back to a cell and someone might want to be jealous of me and want to stab me, or they might want to fight me. My kids might not see me in a couple of years because I might be dead. So when you hang up the phone and you go to your husband or you go to your wife, know that your life is already out there. My life is in here. I'm in the trenches, but I'm not going to make your fight harder by me not knowing what to tell you. Right. I, I just need you to go to court and walk it to walk these papers to court. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. all I need you to do. I want I remember I remember I asked you, it was me, you and Bilal on the phone, and I asked you what um 
what gave you that passion? And both of y'all yelled at me like I was crazy. My freedom, you know, so there is no price that you can pay somebody to give give them the drive that you have when you know your freedom is on the line, man. So Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I want to ask you something, man. One of the things that I notice about you is that you're very adamant about giving back, which is a big reason why you're here today on, on this uh, program. You could have been anywhere telling your story. I know there's people want to tell this story. What gives you that, that heart to give back after all you had to go through to, um, to get your freedom? And let me be clear, folks, the brother, uh, Pat, the, 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 he, beat, he won the decision in the Supreme Court in 2016. He just came home in May. That's four years later. After 1,300 people were freed. After you were in, uh, you know, his story goes on. He saved the officer's life. He sent countless inmates home. Countless inmates went home. Over 100 went home by the work that he did inside for them. And, I mean, he did a suicide watch. Did all, everything he could do. Freed 1,000 plus people. Yet it's still, you still locked up. But you come home, no bitterness, and your objective right now with what you're doing today is to give back. Where does that right. come from? Um, that comes from just, just being a part of the struggle. It comes from struggling in life. You know what I'm saying? I come from a very big family, and um, I was raised with morals. Uh, I, I, knew the, the, I knew the significance of ethics. Mm -hmm. I knew the significance of character, and I knew the significance of standing up for what you believe in. So therefore, those values never left me. So I've said that, you know what I'm saying? I've been blessed. I might not be like the richest person in the world, but I'm blessed enough to know that there's someone that doesn't understand what to do with their situation. So I said, how can I be a solution to it? How can I be a part of the solution? How can I be a part of what's right as opposed to being someone that's draining it for, for, for what I can? I could have walked down that road. I could have said, hey, this is what I want. But I've learned through humility that the best way to display humility is through gratitude. And how to be, basically show gratitude is to help those that you can. You know what I mean? Not someone trying to take advantage. I've, like I've said in the beginning, I've met people that was dead walking and I brought them back to life. Mm -hmm. I've met people that gave up and I gave them back their hope. I've met people that tried to kill themselves, literally cut their wrists and said, hey, this is the only way I could get to this prison to talk to you. And officers say, this is who you got to talk to. This is him. This is who the fuck, excuse me, this is who you want to talk to. He's right there. Go talk to him. So you got four hours to get your stuff together. Wow. Yeah. So and I tell them, this is, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. So people literally had to fight your name was so strong within the system that people were just trying to get to you because they knew what was at stake and they knew you could free them yes wow let yes. me ask you this um uh, mr welch like i know already opportunities have come your way why don't you talk a little bit about some of the things that just in the short time that you've been home that you've already had the opportunity to do and the magnitude of the people that are reaching out to you Right now, I'm helping. Um, um, I plan on helping the, the I've been helping the, fe the federal defenders link cases for people that um, are suffering from COVID, and I've been helping a couple guys get out of prison on COVID um, relief. I've been, like I said, been bridging the gap between attorneys and their clients, and I've been doing cases on on different different issues that I that uh, I feel is are uh, interest that I'm interested in, and I'm working on getting my records expunged. Mm -hmm. I'm working on getting into law school. I've written a book and I've written, well, I've written several books, but one of them is going to be published soon. And I'm just breaking down not only the procedures that I've been through, but I want everyone to know that from an urban perspective, that there is hope if you've made mistakes in your life. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, did, I didn't go to prison as a young guy coming out. I came to prison at 31 and I came out at 41. So therefore, there's not no such thing. There's no hope. There is hope. Right. But you have to determine what your hope is. And no one can force you to believe in yourself. You have to have that understanding of your belief, your self-worth, who you really are, because there's no price on you. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Wells. Like when you said there is hope, can you describe the Constitution 
to people who don't know the value of the Constitution. Can you describe how, in your words, and your thought process, how important that document is to just to us as a people, you know? I mean, the, the Constitution is basically your driver's license to survive in life or your ID. If you don't know about it, you ain't going to get nowhere. You ain't getting in the club. You ain't getting in, 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 in you're not going to be, you're not going to move up in society. Because anybody that's, that's travels or go anywhere in the world, the first thing you need to do is to know that country's laws. And that country's laws is based on their constitution, what they believed in, what their ancestors died for, what their ancestors believed the people should be following whether it was yesterday or 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And that's what I realized. And it, it brought tears to my eyes when I read a lot of the, a lot of the briefs that was filed. And what, one of the things a lot of people don't know about Supreme Court cases is that they do a thing called a statistical analysis. And you are going against the United States. You're not going against um, St. Pete and um, Tampa. You're not going against Orlando and, and Broward County, Dade County. You're going against the United States of America. So states was writing opposition motions against me, saying wow. why I should not have never come out of prison. Not one attorney, multiple attorneys all over America was saying I didn't deserve this, I didn't deserve that. And they was comparing you to a slave comparing you to, to, to anyone that's less than human. I said, no. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Explain so that because there was, um, legally, you mean, legally they were comparing you to a slave, right? Right, legally. Can you explain that a little bit? You got, make it for laymen, make it for us. <laughs> okay, whenever you, whenever you challenge the highest court in the land, they do, what, like I said, a statistical analysis. They basically walk through history of what relevance your case is to those cases. And anyone that reads it with an open mind is going to say, wow, like I was. Mm -hmm. But then you had to sift through that and say, listen, this is history. And you say, I'm history. I'm walking history. So I'm going to, I'm going to use this for other things that can help more people. Because it's not going to stop at me. Mm -hmm. It's going to keep going. So if, so if they're going to own my name for 1900 years, I'm going to be represented in history as someone that actually sifted through the fog, got to the porch, walked into the house and sat at the table and then built his own house mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from what was in the field. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice, nice, man. Nice. So, wow. So now, you know, you, you, you're fighting. People are going home and all you're left with now is I got to regroup because you still got 15 of life hanging on your head right yeah. at this point. So, right. so talk to me about what, you know, how you discuss, I asked you, I asked you this off the air and I love the answer, but talk to me about how you uh, discovered your next step to freedom, you know, your next approach. Okay. You got to remember that I continually kept programming. Mm -hmm. um, I've developed a, uh, a skill set called empathy, meaning that I've looked at other people's problems and I thought how they would feel about it. That's why I did Suicide Watch. And like I said, I've seen I've seen the goods and the bads of Suicide Watch. Some of the things I cannot talk about due to confidentiality. Right. But one of the things about that is that you learn to understand the significance of other people's struggles, other people's pain. And doing that, you look at life differently. Like my views on life is, is totally opposite or totally different than what your views on life would be because mm -hmm. I've seen different aspects of life that not only is, is life altering, but it's also life changing in a positive sense. Mm -hmm. It depends on what road you, you, you decide to walk down. So if you choose to walk down the right road, hey, it's cool, but you're not going to get favorable results every time. Got gotcha. you. I'm going to hold you right there, Mr. Welch. We're going to go to a, a quick break. All right, they folks, listen out there, man. We are talking to Gregory Welch, man, a.k.a. Can I say it? The Supreme Court Gangster. I want to find out where that name comes from and who called you that. And uh, I appreciate y'all for listening, man. We'll be right back, folks. Boston lovers, are you ready for some church? 
the Angels Gospel Show is... Man, I appreciate it, brother. How y'all feeling, everybody? We still on Facebook Live. Y'all remember that? Man, how y'all feeling? How y'all feeling? Let me see if I can see some comments, man. Here. I'm so tech challenged. Man, how y'all doing, Facebook, man? I thank y'all so much for watching, man. I hope y'all appreciate this as much as I do, man. We have living history on, on in, the, in the building this morning, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know what I'm listening, and I, we'll, we'll jump back on this when we get back on the air, man, is uh, is um, is um, what I think your biggest asset is, is your mindset, the way you look at everything. Because if you if you don't have the attitude that you have, if your attitude is any, any way deviated from what you believe in right now, you don't make it. You're still there. You're still riding out 15 to life. Yeah. It's just like um, what Nelson, Nelson Mandela said. He said, um, if you leave prison angry and bitter, you're still in prison. Wow. I had that hanging on my wall. Wow. In, in the prison? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He said, if you leave here angry and bitter, you're still in prison. Then I said, no, nah, I'm not going to be in prison. I said, I wasn't in prison in prison. So how can I be in prison I mean, when I leave? Easy Spice to mention just a few. That's Taste of the Island Marketplace and Restaurant. 22 1934 South Pittsburgh. Call them at 727-873-7559. That's 727-873-7559. The Christian Cinema Hall quote in the African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, it was, man, we found a little bit of Facebook. Yep. It, what up, man? I thank y'all this morning, man. Street. South here in St. Petersburg. Travis, welcome, man, At the China present in, time, saying, all our presentations have been Big placed Francis, on hold to until on the, uh, further notice. The, if you would uh, like to help support the, this ministry, you can call racket. Minister it's Al Lewis, policy, you know, licensed and ordained minister at 727 642 4142. Or you may it's visit so ChristianCinemaHall.org. Looking good, men, boys, and ladies, where? Do you want to good, look your brother? best? Check out Looking Good Men, Boys, Boys and ladies, we're located at 1201 34th Street South, St. Petersburg, yeah, Florida. Man. That's looking good, men, boys, and ladies wear. Looking good is the place for men's suits. Two for 100. Package deals includes suit, shoes, shirt, socks, tie, and hanky. It's all for school, only $129.99. Men two piece Stand sets, all gap, colors man. and sizes. Boys two piece sets, including linen sets. School uniforms oh, yeah. for boys and girls of all sizes. Ladies suits of all colors with matching hats. So if you want to look your best, the place to go is looking good. Good men, boys, and ladies wear. Located at 1201 34th Street South, St. Petersburg, Florida. That's 1201 34th Street South, St. Petersburg, Florida. Or call 727 327 1756. That's 727 327 1756. Opens man. Mondays through Fancy Thursdays, field. 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Friday, 10 a.m. to 7 30 p.m. And on Saturdays, 9 30 a.m. to 7 30 p.m. And remember, we provide alterations of all types, same day or while you wait. Walk-ins are always welcome. If it ain't one thing, it's another. That's right. If it ain't one thing, it's another. Broadcasting live here on 99 Jams. WUJM each and every Thursday morning between 10 a.m. and 12 in the p.m. With your host, Brother West. That's right. We talk about the topic that no one else wants to. We talk about politics, religion, you, me, and everyone else. They help you get through the day. That's right. Just like life. If it ain't one thing, it's another. The hottest show your radio. 99 Jams. The Bird. Yes. Welcome back, everybody. We are making history this morning. We got our first exclusive interview with Mr. Gregory Welsh, man. He is the only federal, black federal inmate in the history of the Supreme Court to win a favorable decision, man. Argued his case all the way, got it in on the first try, made history with that as well, man. Welcome back to the show, everybody. We were talking uh, while, while on break, man, and what what I determined, um, and Alex Jordan, you're exa absolutely right. What I notice about you being your biggest asset, man, is your mindset, brother. If you don't have a growth mindset, if your mindset gets fixed on your surroundings, you're, you're still rotting in the prison right now. Your mind is not. So talk to me about that mindset, man, and, and where that come from. And then encourage, try to encourage somebody, man, to have that mindset. And then we'll get into some of the... Uh, some of the stuff that you had to experience, man, while incarcerated. 
All right, my mindset was based on, like I said before, based on my upbringing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm from a Caribbean family. My family's from Jamaica. And I know the significance of a struggle. Yeah. So mm -hmm. therefore, in life, and let's, just like Frederick Douglass said it best, there is no success without a struggle. All right. So, there, so therefore, if you can't turn your struggles into success, therefore, you're not struggling. If you can't, if you can't equate to what it feels like to be in the trenches, and I'm going to give you another good quote that he said. He said, um, I was at the bottom and I've been broken. And he said, when I, at that moment of being broken is, is the time when I felt something that I've never felt and that not something that I never wanted to feel again. And he said, once I felt that, that was my motivation to go up. Mm -hmm. And I stayed going up because I didn't want to feel that ever feeling again. If you read Frederick Douglass and you know about him, it's called The Narratives of Frederick Douglass. That's one of the deepest books. Right here. Yeah. I got two copies of it. Yeah. You know, I've read things, it. You know, I've read it. And you're, you're absolutely right. Your the drive mm -hmm. is what impressed me about Frederick Douglass also, right? The I remember. The yes. So um, go ahead. Those I'm, black I'm, folks. Say it again. Souls of black folks. I read that. Yes. Yes. Remember what he said. He said, a uh, black man in America or in the world is supposed to have two identities. Once he knows his two identities, he can live anywhere in the world. And my two identities was that I'm, I'm not going to ever stray away from it. I was a convicted felon, but I'm also very intellectual. So mm -hmm. either side you get is what you is what you I'm going to give you the mirror image of who you are in front of me. Wow. But I'm very intellectual. Mm -hmm. Wow, man, I appreciate that. So, talk to me a little bit about, like, what you know, your mindset and the the mindset that you're surrounded by. And, and, and Bilal, you know, you talked a lot about the prison politics and the politics of uh, prison lawyers. You know, how did y'all navigate that? Because the your loyalty, Mr. Welch, to uh, to uh, Mr. Francis is very impressive because you wouldn't even come on my show with me on until the, it was completely signed off by your team. You have extreme sense of loyalty, man. So talk yeah, a little bit yeah. about, you know what I'm saying, how y'all navigated and how that loyalty became, you know. How right, that was, Mr. Francis was like one of the individuals that I spoke to. I also spoke to another brother named um, Unique. He's on Facebook and he uh, called himself, Me he's on Mecca Audio. And me and him was really close also. And him and Mr. Francis was close too. So what happened was, when I was winning in the Supreme Court, guys was was basically what what they was doing to you, all, Mr. Francis. They kept harassing you, telling you that they knew me, we were friends, and we've done this together. And he basically stood up and said, "Excuse me, to your listeners." He said, "Heck no, nah. y'all know y'all don't know that man." And then all that y'all talking about, y'all talking like y'all friends with him, and then he y'all know he's not on nothing that y'all on right now. He ain't at no poker table. He's not buying no weed. He's not doing no drinking. But you all of a sudden know him. Stop that. And they, 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 was a, they started attacking you, right? Mr. Francis. They started attacking him for that. Yeah, um, you know, me and, me and Mr. Wush, I we were suicide companions. I, we were mentors. I taught classes. And, you know, my, my major thing is breaking it down, Ebonics. I have a, I have a knack for that. Because yeah. I like, you know, if you're in them streets or you from the streets and you from the struggle, man, the words are just different, but it's all the same. Politics mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Gregory has said something one day. He made sense. He said politics is a war without bloodshed. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? But um, guys will be, you know, once you once you get known and you're doing something, everybody wants to grab on. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to. And I be giving classes. They be like talking about Greg Welch so this and that. I say, first of all, Stop it, man. Play the tape all the way through. Because what you talking about and what you on, Greg is not even going to associate with you on that there, man. Mm -hmm. he, I know him. You understand what I'm saying? And, uh, yeah, I like Vegas. I admit, I like Vegas. You know what I'm saying? But uh, <laughs> Greg, Greg has always been straightforward. And then they get mad. Then a sad, sad, sad thing is when people come to prison, they're looking for hope. You ain't, uh, you'll, never come, you'll never leave prison the same way you came. We're either going to mm -hmm. leave negative or positive, but the experience is something totally within itself. Mm -hmm. And I hate it. And I still hate to see, because it's about the youth, young brothers come in and get misled by somebody else's game. Mm -hmm. And 
that's the jailhouse lawyer situation. Can you imagine getting 20 years and then you coming through the door and the man say, oh, I can help you. He done been down 20. You understand? So I can help you, but um, he'll go, he'll go slip for, he'll go a note, a list for commissary. Go get this and get that. And the sad part about it in the system, the easiest way to get right back in court is to say my lawyer messed up. But you have you get time barred and you only get certain amount of time to get in. And after five years from now, you done found your way in and you're like, whoa, but you done exhausted it. But this dude here is on the same thing he was on on the street, which is foolishness. Yeah. So now he takes advantage of the young brother coming in for not knowing. And that mm -hmm. irks me. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I used to say, hey, man, listen, man, go find out for yourself, man. If you want something done or you know the crime, my thing is find the criteria and fit that criteria. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because it's personal, it's you. Anything mm -hmm. I want in life, I try to find out what's the criteria for. So now when I go talk to somebody about, hey, this is what I got coming. I'm not mm -hmm. asking Mr. Bird, what am I entitled to? Mr. Bird, this is what I'm entitled to, and this is your job. Right. And, and I fit this. If you don't know I fit it, here's the document showing you I fit it. You understand right. what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. in, it's just like on the street, you know what I'm saying? People have envy of what they don't know. And um, there was a lot of envy with Mr. Welch. Got but it. like I say, he's a fish, he was a fish out of water. There's a lot of envy with Mr. Welch. And I used to tell him, and I tell the people, come on, man. Stop it. Play the tape all the way through, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, they were like, well, even style. You know what I mean? Because you know me, I got to give to gas. I help a brother who wants to help himself. Yeah. And I slide up to Greg. I say, hey, Greg, this dude's a good man, man. Look at his work, man. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? He, he's going through this and that. And Greg was like, but up the loud, okay, now nah, I'm telling you. I'm saying he's a stand up, he's doing, he's trying to improve himself. So you became, yeah. you became a liaison. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. Hey, I admit, that's what I do at times. But yeah. anyway, to make a long story short, man, and um, seeing people in their lowest, seeing people in their lowest, man, and mm -hmm. we, you seeing things, you know, it's humanity. Yeah, I don't care how hard you are, how soft you are. It's humanity, man. When mm -hmm. you look at a situation and you look into it and you know it's not right, some yeah. people aren't able to. Some people aren't able to assist or do anything about it. But when you recognize it, it it hurts, man. And mm -hmm. being inside them, back and forth in that world, man, it hurts, man. And when you, you find know. somebody like Mr. Welch, you can assist, or I can assist. You know, some guys never even know how to fill out their birth certificate paper, their social security card. But they're not going to go to the staff member and say, I don't know how to do this because of ego. Mm -hmm. But they'll come to one of us on the same ground and say, hey, bro, I really don't know. That's cool. But I'm not going to do it for you. I'm going to show you how to do it. And that's yeah. how Mr. Welch is. Yeah. Man. But you that, know. man, it's not about me again. Get with Mr. Welch and my son. Yeah, man. Francis Consulting. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Wow. Man. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing that both you brothers have given over 10 years of your life to the system, right? But you're coming home and you're talking about compassion. You know what I'm saying? You're coming home talking about giving back, man. So we got about another six minutes, man. I knew this hour, five minutes. I knew this hour was going to fly by, man. Mr. Welch, I want to just give you um, time to talk about some of the things that you're doing, some of the things that people can anticipate from you in the ne in the near future, you know, so... Let's let's talk about Mr. Welch's next chapter, man. How is it looking? All right. The next, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. The, the next chapter for me is that um, I've written a book called The Welch Doctrine. And wow. uh, what the Welch Doctrine is about, it talks about um, the times between 2016 to 2018 while I was in prison. And then I'm breaking down my next books that I'm working on, I'm breaking down my mindset. Um, how I view the world and what I'm what I'm doing with my life from from the time that I was in concept from I was born till now. I'm basically like a like a real memoir because I have a lot of notes of what I've done. And then I'm gonna start. St I'm still continue. I'm still advocating for people in prison. Um, I have different attorneys that I talk to, and that I re that I re that reach out to me and I reach out to them. And I've also do a thing called I give them cases so that they can file it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, I'm not an attorney yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on becoming an attorney. And by me working on becoming an attorney, 
my social circle is a lot different than the average person. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, my reputation basically speaks for itself because I'm not one of the ones to say, I've learned the law and I'm the best, I'm good at it. Nah, I focused on my character first before I became good on it. Wow. Because I know I'm from the streets. You know what I mean? So wow. therefore, I've learned that as an attorney, your character speaks for itself. Meaning that if you don't have no kind of character, how can people trust that your judgment is, is sufficient to put words on paper? Mm -hmm. wow. So therefore, I'm, I'm working on, on balancing everything out on the outside world. Mm -hmm. I'm building my network so that I continue to help more people effectively. Mm -hmm. And um, in the future, I'm really pretty much thinking about getting into politics mm -hmm. because of the simple fact is um, by understanding the laws, applying yourself as a part of the solution is be more effective as focus on just being a part of the problem. I'm not a complainer. Wow, man. I, I think it's so amazing, man. And I hope the people that are watching, because I know there's some movers and shakers that um, tend to tune in and we got some really powerful people, man. I hope that they understood the power of your message, man, compassion, giving back character, after being down 10 years, after freeing a thousand plus people and still not going home, your conversation is on character, compassion and giving back, man. I commend y'all folks on this. How can people get in touch with you? Mr. Francis, I know that must go through you. So uh, yeah. give us that contact information, man. How do we, how do we get in contact with Mr. Welch? Um, you can contact Mr. Welch through um, Francis Consultants. And the number is 561. Matter of fact, um, Matt, give it. the number. I got it right here. All right, it's 561-463-8842. I'm saying it again, 561-463-8842. That is Francis Consulting. That is how you can get in contact with Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch has already been contacted by law universities across the country. I think he's a much hotter commodity than we even realize. Uh, I mean, it's a huge deal. The brother made history. We are uh, we are in a in a in a moment in our country's history where I think the time is right for everything that this brother and this movement stands for. Man, I, again, I thank you so much for taking the opportunity to come out and giving me the opportunity to help start to tell your story and get it out there, man. Any last words, Mr. Gregory? We got one minute, man. I just want to tell you, thank you for having me and um, thank all the listeners for listening um, and know the significance that any hardship you go through, you can always turn it around. It's your perception of it that makes the significance after the fact. Man, that's powerful stuff, folks. Listen, man, Matt B, man, live every Thursday morning, man, 99 Jams. Last week, we interviewed a judge that was 30, uh, a, a candidate running for a black female candidate running for judge 36 years old this week we have a a brother that took a case all the way to the supreme court from the federal penitentiary folks if y'all not motivated man and he come home talking about character compassion and love man and and, and doing things right and giving back man he, and he started with us folks thank y'all so much man until next time man y'all dream big man Listen, believe in yourself, man. Fight for yourself, man, and be beautiful, man. I love y'all so much, man. Thank y'all so much for listening, man. Until next time, man. It's your boy, Matt B., man. Thank y'all. WJM, St. Peter's Friday still on, um, Night Jams. Still on Facebook. Gospel lovers, are you ready for some church? Wow, man, that was amazing, man. I want to just say thank you, man. We don't have to get all, but we still got a few people watching, man. But uh, I think... Uh, Mr. Welch, man, again, man, I can't thank you enough. Your story is amazing. I think uh, every book that you mentioned should be in circulation, man. We have a program where uh, it's, I work in reentry, you know, and what I, what I realized, Mr. Welch, 100%, the biggest asset I could be to somebody is to help them look in the mirror, man, and believe in themselves, man. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, man. So I want to thank you brothers, man, for your time, man. And, uh, We'll wrap it up, man. I hope this is not the last time we hear from you, Mr. Welch. And I really look forward to seeing where your movement and your character, man, and your mindset takes you, bro. 
because I think that, man, and I didn't even anticipate that, brother, but to me, that's what I'm all about, man, attitude, man. I tell people all the time, all I got going for me, man, is a is a good attitude and faith, man. So, again, thank you. Any one of you brothers have some last words? That's it, man. All right, man, we'll shut it down, man. Thank y'all, man. Until next time, Facebook, thank y'all for watching, man. Y'all share this awesome story, man. And if y'all have questions, get with me. I'll get you to Mr. Francis, all right? Love y'all, man. Until next time, man, I'm going to sign it out, man. Thank y'all so much, fellas. Thank you for having us. Yeah.